It is Advent, and so we have an Advent reading and lighting that we're going to have this morning. It'll be done by the Casterman family. So come on up. The word Advent literally means coming. As such, the Advent season is a time to remember that Jesus both came into the world and has promised to come again. Advent points to the past, present, and future. We remember the past birth of the Christ child. We anticipate our present celebration of his birth, and we hope with expectancy for his future return. Isaiah 9-2 says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. We light this candle in anticipation of the coming light of Christ Jesus. This first candle represents the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Speaking of the hope found and offered in Jesus Christ, the following verses were written hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, yet prophetically and poetically speak of his coming and what it will mean for the world. In reading Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness that the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young children will put it, its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. And in the day that the root, as the waters cover the sea, in the day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples, the nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for sending your Son into the world. We remember his birth, death, resurrection, and look forward to his return. Today we celebrate the hope we have in Jesus. Help us prepare our hearts for the coming light of Christ. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, my name is Chris Quinn. I am the youth pastor here this morning, and I have the privilege to bring the sermon to you this morning. And um, as you can tell, we do not have projection with us this morning. Unfortunately, it just decided today not to work. So, you know, sometimes it just, for some reason, it decides to do that. It's like, no, nope, not going to work. They're not going to talk to each other, computer and projector. So we kind of just said, forget it. And so we apologize, but this is what we have this morning. Um, and also, I want to get this out of the way to, to clear the air so that you're not thinking about it too much. Um, you're probably hearing my voice is raspy. Um, just so you know, I'm not sick. I'm also not dying. Um, I don't have anything like that going on in there, but what I do have is a cyst or a polyp that has decided to grow on my vocal cord. And so it sounds like I'm sick, but I have to have surgery on January 9th to get it cut out. Yay! Um, I've actually never had a surgery like that before. I've had my wisdom teeth taken out, but I mean, that's just funny. Um, so I, yeah, so I have to do that. So don't be afraid. I'm not losing my voice. I'm not struggling. It doesn't hurt. It just sounds like it does. So just be aware of that. That's what's going on. Um, and you can be praying for that. Um, so January 9th. Okay, let's get into what we're going to talk about this morning. So doesn't it seem like within epic blockbuster movies that there are these moments within these movies that 
the characters, the main characters, the protagonists are in this moment that where all hope seems lost. Everything has gone against them and they look around themselves and they say, we are in trouble. Hope is lost. They get discouraged and then there's a dramatic turn where suddenly something happens to change the entire scene, to change the entire movie and everything turns into the favor of the protagonists. And I apologize, I just spoiled about 75% of movies for you because that's about how they go, all, most Hollywood movies. Um, but that's kind of like, and we kind of have these kind of experiences too. You might even be in the middle of a situation like that right now where you are wondering and you're seeing hopelessness around you. You're wondering where God is, what he's up to, why he's doing what he's doing. And let me tell you, God hasn't abandoned us. God has not forsaken us. Even individually, God has not given up. God is constantly moving, working, preparing for greater works to come our way, to come into this world. And our, our call is to obey him, to seek to trust him in this and believe him in it, even when it all seems lost. And our point of what we're going to be talking about for this series, the Advent series, is just obey. And that even when we have doubts, our call is in when God prompts us, when God asks us to do certain things that we need to still obey, even if we have doubts. So if, if you're in the supermarket and God says to you to go and be a friend to someone who looks like they're in need of a friend, go and do it. If you feel this tug in your heart that God is saying, I want you to get up early, spend more time in my word and pray with and, and pray. That's, where we, that's what we got to do. And so things like that. God comes to you and he says these things. But most of all, we talked about hope already this morning, our Advent candle. We need to learn that there is great reason to have hope, even while we are in the middle of our doubts. And so we're going to look at four reasons, four reasons why we can have hope in the midst of our doubts. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. If you do not have a Bible, uh, I invite you to go ahead and grab one of the brown Bibles in front of you. It's going to be on page 1024. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1, 5 through 25, going through the famous story of Zechariah and the angel, a uh, very famous Christmas story. So we're going to go ahead. We are going to read verses 5 through 10 in Luke chapter 1. I had a PowerPoint already, but again, nothing. So I apologize um, about that. So here we go. Verse 5, Luke 1. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving his priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So what we see going on here is, is Luke is setting the stage. The point of the gospel of Luke in general, if you don't already know, is that it is a compilation of eyewitness accounts to Jesus, basically validating the claims of Jesus by looking at witnesses. It's like trying to build a court case. The best way to build a court case is to find eyewitnesses who saw what happened. So Luke is finding people to bring about this case, to prove that Jesus is who he says he was, that he was the Messiah, and that he was God, and that he came to die on the cross and rose again from the dead, all of that. That's the point of what Luke is doing. So Luke, in this section, is, he's setting the stage for what the situation was like at the time when Jesus was getting ready to arrive. So he starts by telling us that King Herod was ruling at this time in Judea. If you look at the history of King Herod, this is not a good man. And Israel was not happy to have him as their king for a few reasons. First, he represented Roman authority. He represented the fact that they were under the Roman government at the time. And that was just another um, line in the succession of oppression that they were going through. They had rulers after rulers after rulers that were oppressing them, that were not 
Israelite rulers. And so this was something that would have been difficult and hard and frustrating for the Israelites to see. Not only that, he wasn't totally Jewish. He had some Israelite in him. He was about half. But the other half, he was an Edomite, meaning he was from the line of Esau. Jacob and Esau, if you know that story in the book of Genesis. And so Israel was not, the Jews were not happy about this. Having a king who was not totally Jewish, who was also oppressive and who was a, 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 a not a nice ruler, ruling over them, not a kind man. And so what this would create is this feeling of, of hopelessness in the nation because they would have been feeling this for a while. God had promised them thousands of years before that there would be a Messiah that would come and free them. And the way they saw it, it was he was going to be a conquering king. He was going to take over whoever was oppressing them and he was going to rule in Jerusalem for forever. So this was something they were looking forward to. But after years and years and years, hundreds, thousands of years of waiting for this Messiah to come, they're hopeless. They're waiting. So Zechariah is in the middle of this. And he's a priest. And so there's a part of him where he has to be in the temple of God. He has to be working for God and feeling, probably feeling a little bit of this hopelessness. But then he has something else going on with him. It says that, look at verse 6, that both of them, him and his wife, were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. And the way that this is being put, this is a good man. This is not like a man who has all these external righteousness and he looks good on the outside, like he has, has it all under control. He's actually a guy who truly is righteous before God. He knows God. He desires to please God with his life and he desires to obey God with, or with God's commands. He, obeys, he desires to obey the commands, both him and his wife. And they were doing it blamelessly. Not meaning they were perfect, but meaning that they did it open-hearted to God, transparent, living their lives, desiring for God to work in their lives. But verse 7 gives us something to give a little more picture about their personal life. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. It's interesting that Luke does this. What he's doing is he's, he's painting this tension, this picture that to a first century Jew, they would understand. That to them, someone who, or a family who was childless and had been trying for their whole lives, and you know, it says they're very old, so they've been trying for a long time. For them to be childless was a sign to first century Jews that of God's divine disfavor on their lives. Can you imagine that? Being, reaching old age and not having to be able to bear children, living your life doing the best that you can, doing everything that God has ever commanded you, wanting to be righteous, wanting to please God, wanting him to work in your, in your life and, and not seeing it happen. Not seeing him provide in this one seemingly very simple but very um, beautiful way that God could just provide and give this amazing gift. And they had to wait and wait. And not only that, because it was a sign of disfavor from God, you can also imagine the people around them talking behind their back, wondering what Zechariah and Elizabeth had done or what's going on in their, own, in, in their own hearts. Why God hasn't blessed them. Why God hasn't given them a child up to this point. Why are they so displeasing to God when they look so good on the outside? So you create this tension. Luke does this and it's brilliant. And here's the thing that we have to understand is that God doesn't work in this one-to-one -one relationship with if you do good things, you're only going to get good things. Or if you do bad things, you're only going to get bad things. Guys, that, that's karma. That's not in the Bible. That's, that's, that's Hinduism. That's not Christianity whatsoever. That's not how God works. There is this beautiful mystery of why things happen like this, why bad things happen to good people. One of my favorite books in all the Bible is the book of Job. And in the book of Job, the story goes like this. Job is a blameless, righteous man. So he's much like Zechariah. And God allows for Satan to basically destroy everything he has besides taking his life, besides killing him. Even up to his own skin is affected by these trials. 
And Job begins to wonder why, why this has happened. He knows he's a righteous man. And then he has these three uh, yahoos for friends that come to him and they say, well, Job, it's because you have, done, you have obviously done something wrong. God is upset with you. Just admit it and, God, and it'll all be over. And Job says, I haven't, I haven't done anything wrong. I've asked God. I've begged him to tell me, to let me know if there's something I've done, but he hasn't said anything. And so throughout the book is this back and forth between Job's friends and Job himself. Basically the same argument over and over again. I haven't done anything wrong. Yes, you have. I haven't. No, back and forth. Sounds like little children bickering. Okay. And by the end of the book, God decides finally, okay, I've had enough of all this talk. I'm going to show up. I'm going to say something. And this is the gist of what God responds to, or what God says. Because he doesn't respond by answering the question of why. But he gives an answer with the answer of who. And he's talking about himself. This is what he does. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he does this for three chapters. After a while, you'd be, if you're Job, you're like, okay, I get, I, I get the point. Oh, no, he's going to keep going. Okay, I, I think I get it. Um, and a couple times, God gets sarcastic with him. And he says, yeah, surely, surely, Job, you know. You were there, right? You were there when I created the whole world. So you know all about what I'm up to. And the whole point of what God is doing in that circumstance, in that story, is he's telling Job and he's telling all of us who get to read it later, that God is sovereign. God is in control. God has power that goes beyond what we can understand. And so that's our first reason that we can have hope in the midst of doubt is that God is sovereign over creation and history. I'll say that again. God is sovereign over creation and history. He's sovereign over both. So think of it like this. Especially in thinking about all your doubts, all the things you're worried about, wondering whether God is going to move and in circumstances that you are dealing with in your own life. Think of it like this. God created the whole world simply by telling it to. Simply by saying, let there be light, and he breathed it into existence. Just like that. Amazing. You know, sometimes we might think he was like uh, the genie from Aladdin and just kind of zapped it with his finger, okay? Uh, but no, he just spoke it into existence. When was the last time you did something like that? Um, pizza. Dang it. Didn't happen. Pizza, okay? That's not how it works. God does, you, we can't do that. That's something that God can do. So think of it like this. If God can breathe all of life as we know it into existence, a barren old woman's, you know, giving a child to a barren old woman is child's play. That's nothing for him. He can do that in an instant. So he's sovereign over it. He can do it. He can take what seems impossible and make it totally possible because he made it all. But then we see that he's also sovereign over history. When we look at the, sec the next paragraph, the verses 8 through 10, and Zechariah is getting this set up for a divine appointment to, to stand before an angel and hear what God is planning on doing. Zechariah was a priest, like is already mentioned. And he was part of one of 24 main groups of priests. And what would happen is each, 20, one, each of those 24 groups would be responsible to serve at the temple and offer prayers and incense two weeks, excuse me, two weeks out of the year. And not just that, like, because they had so many priests, they would have to send the subgroups. So they even had subgroups of the 24. So they have to send a smaller group to go and do the prayers and the burning of the incense. And so this was likely the one time that Zechariah was going to have an opportunity to go into the temple. It's probably the only time this ever happened. And they chose it just by, you know, best way I can describe it culturally is rolling the dice. Okay, Zechariah, if we get a seven, it's your turn. Seven, Zechariah, you're up. And this is a turn. This is a turn in the story for Luke. Because at this point, like I said, for them to be childless, it was almost a sign that God was upset with them about something. God was displeased with them. 
But for Zechariah to get this chance to go into the temple, we now get this signal that, you know what? God is up to something. God is going to do something. Because he's showing everyone else, and he's showing Zechariah, I'm giving you a chance. Here, you, are, you get to go in. This is, a, this is an amazing circumstance that happens in his life. And so we see that God, again, he sets up this appointment. He's setting this all together. And so we, when we look at the next part, we see that, and remember, God is sovereign over creation and history. That's our first reason why we can have hope in the midst of our doubts. Let's look at the next section, verses 11 through 17. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this angel appears to Zechariah and he delivers to him two amazing pieces of good news. First of all, he, give, he tells him, Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. You're going to have a son. It's happening. The thing you've been praying about for your entire life, it's happening. I am giving you that son. I am promising it to you, even though it seems impossible. And then second, your son is actually going to be the man that's been prophesied about in the Old Testament that is preparing the way for the Messiah to come. So Zechariah just got privy, the first person on the earth to hear the Messiah is coming. He's on his way. To Zechariah, to a first century Jew, this would have been the most exciting thing they have ever heard in their entire life. The joy that should have been welling up inside of Zechariah could have been overwhelming just because of the fact that one, you're finally going to get a son that you've been praying for and waiting for your whole life. And also the Messiah has finally come that you have been praying for and waiting for your whole life. This should have been the most exciting news that has ever come. And we see that in this story, that God is giving to his people. This is our second reason why we can have hope in the midst of doubt, is that God gives graciously to his people. Let me say that again. God gives graciously to his people. Here's the amazing thing about this, is that Israel did not deserve the Messiah, did not deserve Jesus. Honestly, neither do any of us in this room. Not especially me. I know I don't deserve it. But yet God didn't give up. God didn't stop his plan of the Messiah. He didn't see the brokenness of the world and then just say, you know, that whole Messiah business. Yeah, let's, let's, let's forget that. This place is too messed up. He still sent Jesus, even though this world is messed up and his people were faithless, he decided to be faithful. And that's the amazing thing. Jesus still was coming. And this is, why, this is amazing news, that God still gives graciously to his people even when we have not been totally faithful to him. It's an amazing thing. So again, Zechariah should have been excited, should have been overjoyed at this news, but as we'll see, he has the opposite reaction. We'll be in verse 18 through 22. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. So Zechariah's first response is to ask a question. 
And actually, it's the same type of question that Mary asks in the next story when the angel Gabriel shows up to her and tells you, you're going to have a son or you're going to have a child even though you are a virgin. But the difference why Zechariah gets a punishment and Mary doesn't is the response in the heart. Zechariah responds with unbelief, with doubt, with frustration. You can almost hear in this situation, you almost hear Zechariah's frustration and anger at what he has dealt with his entire life, kind of almost welling up in his heart. And if we're honest, all of us have been there. We might have had a broken relationship of some sort, whether it's a friendship, marriage, or even a family relationship that just fell apart and we wondered why God was doing it. We might have gotten a, a medical diagnosis that totally floored us. We were unprepared. One, and we begin to wonder, God, why me? Or we might lose our job and wonder, God, when will you provide? We have all these questions. We have all these doubts wondering who God is. And you can almost hear Zechariah say in this moment, God, where have you been? I have been waiting my whole life for you to tell me that I'm going to have a son. I have done everything you've ever wanted me to do. I have obeyed you. I have listened to your commands. I have done what I'm supposed to do as a priest. And you never gave, and you waited till now to give me this child. Why did you wait until now? And if we're honest, we do the same thing. We wonder, we question, we get frustrated. And yes, God does discipline Zechariah by telling him, sorry, you're not going to be able to speak until your son is born. But that's also another, that's a, it's actually, it serves another purpose besides just a discipline. What it actually is, it's also a sign to Zechariah. He tells him, this is the sign that you're going to know that this is true, that I'm going to deliver on my promises. You're not going to be able to talk for nine months. I know for my surgery, I talked about earlier, I won't be able to talk for five days, which is going to be really weird. I can't talk because um, that's what I do. I talk. Um, but nine months, I can't even fathom that silence for nine months. And he's like unable, like he can't speak. And actually, when you explore and dig into the passage a little bit, it's actually pretty, pretty well likely as well that he was probably deaf too because they had to make signs to him. They couldn't speak to him and he couldn't respond back. So unable to communicate in any way, shape or form except in writing. Whew. That would have been hard. But here's the thing. Zechariah with his reaction could have deserved, you know, a good old smiting, just being killed on the spot. But God did something totally different. God was gracious with him. God was patient. And here's the thing. This is reason number three we can have hope. Is that God is patient with our doubts. This has been one of the most liberating things in my life as a Christian. Is that God isn't afraid of your questions. What God, is not, what God doesn't like is for you to simply say to him, I don't believe you because of what I'm going through. I give up on you, God. I'm done. I don't believe you. That's it. What God is patient with is doubts. I've been a person that, I'm, I'm a thinker. And sometimes, no, not sometimes, a lot of times I overthink and think about things way too deep. And God has been very, very patient with me throughout my life because I'll have these moments where I think of something, I go, oh God, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I don't have an answer for that question I don't know, if, I don't know if, you're, if you're real or if you're true. This could throw the whole thing out. God says, no, just look into it. Research. And he knows me. He knows that I like to learn. So, of course, I'm going to go research and look it up. But God is patient with me in those times, even though I'm questioning him. I'm frustrated with him. I don't understand. But eventually, God makes it clear. God loves to make himself clear and known. That's why you have the Bible in front of you that you do. Because God wanted to make himself known to you. If you're ever wondering who God is and what he's like, open up the Bible. Read it. Learn from it. A lot of my answers to my questions have come from the Bible itself. And learning, you know, what the passages are actually trying to say. But it's been so huge in my life to have this. 
to have these. But God is not afraid of them. When you look at the book of Psalms, and one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 13, it says, in the beginning, it's kind of depressing. It's basically like, God, you've forgotten me. Why have you forgotten me? Why have you left me? When will you come back? And at the end, the psalmist just says, but I trust you. But I trust you. So God is not afraid. God knows that this is what's going to happen to us, that we're going to have doubts. That, you know, especially even when there's those moments, like we talked about with what this series is about, that God's going to bring to you and say to you, you know, I think you should go tell your friend, relative, or relative about your relationship with me. I think you should go do that. There's going to be that moment of, wait, was that actually you, God? I don't know that that was actually you. You know, they're, they're having a bad day. I don't want to do it. You know, I, I'll, I'll just leave them alone. Or you see, a, you see a, a homeless person outside the grocery store. You have this moment where you could unleash some, you know, unprecedented compassion upon their life by talking to them, praying for them, even giving them resources so that they can get a free meal, get some meal, get some food for them, okay? Um, being absolutely gracious. Here's the thing. When God brings those up, those are moments for you to learn to walk in obedience. Even if you don't feel like, even if it's one of those moments you're like, God, you know, honestly, I feel super awkward about this and I just don't want to do it. God will work through you. Um, I always use this analogy because sometimes we get this mentality that, you know, God, I want to do these things because I, you know, or I want to do these things when I want to do them. When I feel it in my heart, you know what? I, want, I just want to do it. Parents in the room, I, um, imagine this scenario. I'm going to especially point out teenage parents. Okay? Sorry, guys. I had to. Um, say you come to your teenager and you tell them, hey, I would like for you to clean your room. Okay? And they look at you and they say, you know, mom and dad, I love you so much so much that I want to learn to want to do what you tell me to do. But, you know, right now, I just don't want to. So I'm not going to do it. How's that going to go, parents? That's not going to go well. <laughs> that conversation, well, you can either do it or be grounded. Okay? <laughs> God, and that's kind of the similar thing. God expects for you to obey. And let me just tell you, my parents are here. If I had pulled that on them, <laughs> bad news, okay? <laughs> Would not have been a good moment for me. Um, but God expects obedience. God desires obedience. Yes, he does want to change, you want you to want to do it. But there's a certain point where sometimes we kind of have to buck up and just do it. And you know, I've actually heard many stories of people who have, taking the opportunity when God prompts them to do something and it seems weird, seems out of the ordinary for them to do, you know, to go and talk to a total stranger about their faith or um, to sit down and talk with their relative about what they believe or to be, un, you know, uncharacteristically kind to a person in need. What God does as a result, that God moves in an amazing way. I'll give an example of a mistake I made. I had a friend in high school, and the kids, the, the youth have heard this story probably a dozen times or so. Um, but I had a friend in high school who I felt God was telling me over and over again, you need to talk to this guy. You need to talk to him. You need to do it. And I didn't. But then he turned out to be a neighbor of one of my best friends who also went to youth group with me, and he knew where we went every Tuesday. And so one day at school, he just goes, hey, you know what? I'll go to church. I'm going to go to your youth group tonight. Oh boy. That was one of those moments like, well, okay, God, you gave me a free pass on that one, I guess. Could have done it. Now, this guy, um, they actually ended up letting me baptize him when we were in high school, and he is now studying to be a pastor. I should have capitalized on that. <laughs> but God still used me. God still did it. This is what God does. This is how he works. He's patient with us in our doubts. But let me tell you from lots of experience, don't wait, obey. Do what God says 
And it's not because God is some overlord that's trying to control your life. He's trying to direct you into a path of what real joy and what real life is all about. As Jesus even said himself, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. God is not a buzzkill. He's about your joy. That's what he's all about. So the last paragraph, we see what the reaction should have been from Zechariah. Look at verse 23. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Elizabeth's reaction is immediately recognizing that this was God who did it and that God removed her shame. All the shame she felt from other people, what they had done, what they had said, what they had felt, what she had perceived they felt and said about her, all that shame she felt herself from not being able to bear children. She responded immediately and said, this is God. This is, this is God. He did this. He has shown me favor. You know what? I'll tell you, even though Elizabeth was a righteous woman, she didn't deserve this. But this is God being gracious. But this is the fourth reason why, God, why we can have hope in the midst of our doubts is that even though we are in the middle of our doubts, that, that God's desire is to redeem our brokenness and shame. God is not about you just staying in the middle of the muck and the mire and the hardships of life. Yes, Hardships are always going to come. It's going to always be a part of life because we live in a broken world. But let me tell you, God always is seeking to redeem and make new the things in your life. And that brokenness and that shame so that you can be used for the glory of God. That's what God wants to do. That's his ultimate plan. That's his ultimate goal. And let me just tell you, it's okay to not be okay. But God is not okay with keeping you there. He wants to work in your life so that he can move you out into a greater abundance of life, to know him greater, to see your heart changed, to see you be an impact on this world for the kingdom of God. That is his ultimate goal. And you know what? This happened for Zechariah. Zechariah changes. Think nine months of silence might do that to a person. Gives you a little bit of time to to be with your own thoughts. Zechariah at the end, and we see at the end of the chapter in chapter one of Luke, that John is born. They're having an argument. His family members and they're having an argument with Elizabeth about what the child is going to be named. And Elizabeth is insisting the child's name is going to be John. He is going to be John. And they're all saying, but Elizabeth, nobody in your family is named John. That's ridiculous. Why would you name him John? And Zechariah pulls out something, writes on it, and writes, his name is John, and hands it out. And at that moment, I think it's truly, he's showing that he is, he understood. He, he got the lesson. He learned it. He was trusting God. He was believing God because one of the main, the main sign had happened that his son was going to be born. And so he now trusted God, and then God opened up his mouth, and he was able to speak. And all he speaks, he, he sings a song. It's the beauty of scripture. Sometimes they just break into song. He breaks into song and it's all about how gracious and amazing and wonderful God is and how he worked in his life. So we see that change. So I wanna, I wanna close with this, is that at the end of the day, God is gonna be calling us to do something. He's gonna come to us. He's gonna be asking something of us that might seem incredible, that might seem outside of our realm of possibility. But our call is not to um, negotiate with God or to disregard it, but to say, you know what, God, I'm gonna step out and obey because I know you wanna do what's good for me. And let me tell you, one of the best ways to figure out whether it's God talking to you or not is if it matches up with what um, the Bible says. If you get a, a thought in your mind, but I'm telling you, if it's a thought in your mind, like go talk to that person about Jesus. I don't think Satan's ever going to tell you to do that. Go talk to that person about Jesus. If you feel that, I can promise you that's the Holy Spirit. It's going to be the evil ones coming to you saying, you know, maybe you shouldn't. It would be really awkward. They might not like you. They might think you're weird. They probably will. I'll just lay that out there for you. They're probably going to think you're a little weird. 
That's okay. But here's the thing. God will present these things. God will open up doors because he desires to see us follow him and desires to redeem us. And sometimes obeying is a part of that redemption process about seeing God work in our life. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word that opens up our hearts, exposes us for what we're really like, but God, also that you are gracious and compassionate and patient. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for being patient with me. And so, God, this morning, we we thank you for your word. We thank you that we could be here worshiping you freely. And God, we desire to, to obey you, to follow your word, to follow your commands. God, not because they're burdensome, God, but because it is the way you have designed this world to operate. So God, we thank you for this morning and we pray this in your name. Amen.